Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us today. So my name is Simone, I'm Community Manager with the OED team and I'll be hosting the session today. I'm delighted to be here today with Dr. Tanya Saley and Dr. Eto Makella. So now, without further ado, I'm passing it on to Dr. Saley and Dr. Makella so they can begin. Great, thanks Simone. So my name is Tanja Seilu and uh, from September onwards, uh, September onwards I will be the Assistant Professor in English Language at the University of Helsinki. And my research interests include historical social linguistics, so I'm interested in how different social groups use language and how they contribute to language change in the history of English. And then the corpus linguistics, so I look at language use in large electronic test databases and then I'm interested in uh, developing methods for corpus linguistics and historical social linguistics with people like Ed. Yeah, so I'm Ed Makela. Uh, I have a background in computer science, so I did my doctorate um, at a technical university um, and I became interested in how computer science and tools developed there could be of use to people in the humanities to support them in doing their humanities research. So I've lately collaborated with multiple different projects of which this is one uh, that uh, uh, on developing tools and workflows uh, by which humanities scholars could do their work more efficiently with the aid of computational tools. Yeah, and now we are working in the Academy of Finland funded Stratas project, which uh, uh, where one of the sub projects is this discovering new words. So let's start. So this is what we are going to present to you today. We've got two case studies for you, one about 18th century new words and then one about 17th century. And in between it will be talking about the technical details. And at the end there will be a Q&A session. So the research questions that we are interested in are basically who creates and adopts new vocabulary in the history of English? Are there any differences across social groups? Because we know that previous research has really focused on published writings by basically highly educated men. So uh, language used by women and the lower social ranks has been ignored. So uh, we've previously done some case studies of English nominal suffixes like ness and it and er and we have found some social linguistic variation in the productivity of these suffixes. So different groups of people use them in different ways. And of course looking at new vocabulary, well the first problem that you come across is what is a new word? So is it something that is not in the speaker's or writer's sort of own lexicon? Or is it something that it's not found anywhere else before that even? And is it okay that if it's just a nonce word or does it have to kind of become established in the language? And then what about all of these different methods of creating new words? So do we count words formed by compounding? Probably yes, words like bus driver, uh, affixation, adding suffixes or prefixes, zero derivation, you've probably heard about nouning verbs or verbing nouns. Uh, semantic neologism, so you don't really make a new word, but you get a new sense for an existing word. Uh, then you can, of course, borrow words from other languages, and you can kind of try to come up with your own words as well, so completely new coinage. And then, of course, our problem was how do we actually study the social aspects of the use of new words? And we have done something, so this is an example from uh, my earlier productivity research. So I was looking at the suffix er as in writer and I was looking here I'm looking at sort of the combination of age and gender. So which age and gender groups perhaps uh, use the suffix more productively than others. And we can see here that it's actually uh, older men who tend to use it very productively. So male 45 and above. So this is an, a quick example of what we've done before. And now the workflow for discovering new words. So the research question was social dif differences in the coining and use of new words. So the approach is that we take a collection of texts with social metadata. So we know who the writers are, we know their social background. And then we try to find who they use these words that are not found elsewhere before. And then we try to discover differences by uh, social status or the region from which the person is from or their gender and so on. So how do we find words that are not found elsewhere before? We can uh, compare the words against dictionaries, like the, the OED, 
or then other text collections. So we've got these massive historical text collections that we can use. So this is our main source, the Corpora of Early English Correspondence. And this is now a collection of personal letters from about 1400 to 1800. And by personal, we just mean that we have an identifiable writer and recipient. So they are not all private letters, they can also be official and sort of business letters, for example. And we've got more than a thousand writers, about 12,000 letters and more than five million running words in this corpus. And it was compiled here in Helsinki by Professor Terttu Nevalainen and Helena Rauhle Grunberg and others from the early 1990s onwards. And I actually came into the project in the 2000s. And uh, because we wanted to get sort of a lot of data, we based this on published editions of letters. So we basically scanned them in, we did optical character recognition, and then we did a lot of rounds of proofreading. And the corpus was compiled for historical social linguistics. So it was one of the first corpora that were compiled for this purpose. So, so that we would be able to compare the language use of different social groups. So we wanted to include letters by both men and women and of all social ranks and from all regions of England, basically equally for every 20 years life. But of course, I mean, we don't have equal amounts from all of these social groups. It's again, it's the highly educated men whom people have been most interested in and for, for whom we have most of these published editions. But still the aim was to at least have something from, from all of these groups for every 20 years lies in the corpus. And then we have metadata on the letters, writers and recipients. So we know who they are, we know their social background, so we can use this information. And also this genre is kind of speech-like, which is nice for social linguistic studies, because it has been said that sort of speech is like the hotbed of change. And obviously we don't have access to actual speech in the history of English, especially not in this far. So uh, we can use these genres that are kind of speech-like. Letters are interactive, they have like writers and recipients and so on. So we can ask questions like which social groups lead linguistic change? or which groups are innovators in lexical change as well. And one thing you should know about this corpus is that there is a lot of spelling variation. So this makes our job a little bit harder, but it's also very interesting. So coming back to the workflow. So we take a collection of texts with social metadata and this is the C corpus. And then uh, how to find words not found elsewhere before. We compare it against dictionaries and these include the OED and also the Middle English Dictionary for the earliest periods in our corpus. And then the other text collections include uh, British Library newspapers, the Bernie and Nichols collections, which also contain something like newspapers, and then these massive 18th century collections online and early English books online, which kind of aim to represent all printed texts from about 1500 to whatever, 1900, so that they are really, really massive. So let's move right on to the first case study. So this is new words in 18th century letters. And we are using the long 18th century from our corpus, so about 1680 to 1800. We've got uh, more than 300 writers where we know their social backgrounds, about 5,000 letters and 2 million learning words. And the criterion for new word was that the first attestation in our corpus must be earlier than or the same as the first attestation in the OED. And also then that the word could occur in no more than 100 contemporary published texts before the first attestation in our corpus. And I think Eto will be talking about why we had this criterion later on. But anyway, uh, we have this nice pipeline and automated procedures which ended up with only 220 candidates for me to filter in the interface that we have created and I found 81 new words. So let's take a look at their social embedding. Who are the innovators? So on the right, we have the people uh, sorted by the number of new words that they produced. And uh, compared to the num number of running words that we have from them, there's clearly one person who stands out. So there's Thomas Twining, who was just a country clergyman, but he, he is very creative in his language use. Then we've got some authors, which is quite expected. So we've got Jane Austen, we've got Jeremy Bentham and Thomas Gray, a poet. And then we have two people from kind of a lower social rank. So we've got John Jackson, uh, who was a farmer's son, and then Walthazar St. Michel, who I think was like a naval officer or something to do with the Navy. And then we've got a lot of uh, letters from Lady Mary Wortley Montague, but only one neologism. So this would be, I would say, surprisingly few. And we can also see some social networks between these people who are using new words. 
So, for example, Thomas Twining knew the Burnies, so Fanny Burney, the novelist, and her father, Charles Burney. And then uh, also John Jackson and both of us, St. Michelle, knew each other because they were related to Samuel Pepys, the famous diarist. So here are a couple of examples. So first of all, John Jackson writing actually about Samuel Pepys to Pepys's friend, John Evelyn. So Samuel Pepys has just passed away and John Jackson, his nephew, is informing Evelyn about his sad occasion. So he writes, I must not admit acquainting you, sir, that upon opening his body, which the uncommonness, so this is the new word now, uncommonness of his case required of us for our own satisfaction as well as public good, there was found is in his left kidney a nest of no less than seven stones of the most irregular figures your imagination can frame, and weighing together four and a half ounces. So Jackson, a farmer's son, uh, thanks to Pepys's patronage, actually, he got a good education, and now he's able to use these uh, fancy abstract nouns like uncommonness. And then we have an example from Thomas Twining, who's one of my favorite people in this corpus. He is really an exciting person, but let's see. So he's writing to Charles Burney, who was a music historian, writing a history of music right now. And then Twining is kind of helping him with that. But I don't recollect any single word in our language but tune that expresses the intuneness of an interval. Intonation is rather more scientific and jargonic than I like. So jargonic is the new word here. But actually, there's another word that's not even in the OED, so in tuneness. And he's kind of he's written it with a hyphen to sort of show that it's a bit weird, maybe. But Twining is really a very sort of innovative person, creative. Right, but then uh, widening the focus a bit, so we looked at individuals, but let's look at their social ranks or social status now. And again, on the right, we have sort of people ordered by the number of neologisms by social rank. So we've got professional people like lawyers and authors and so on, first and so on. But when we compare it to the number of running words we've got from these groups, we can see that it's uh, lower clergy who seems to have surprisingly many new words, but this is mostly due to Thomas Twining. But then it's the lowest social category of other non-gentry, which has surprisingly many. So we've got uh, people like John Jackson, the farmer's son, who was upwardly mobile. Then we've got uh, someone called Ignacio Sancho, who was the son of a slave, actually, and really upwardly mobile as well. And then we've got a farmer, George Cully. And we've got a lot of letters from royalty, but only one new, new word from them. So for some reason, royalty are not really into creating new words or using them. Again, some examples. So first from the farmer to his brother, they were kind of farming together. So Mr. Collins prized up is not very capital to handle, but rather catchy to look at. So catchy doesn't really look like it's really new to Collie himself. He's not like underlining it or any, anything like that. And it might be that this is actually a fairly recent, also a fairly common word in his social circle, but it's just something that is not really present in the OED or in the published texts. But anyway. Then we've got Sancho writing to a friend. We hope he is well and enjoys this fine weather, unplagued by flies and unbeaten by fleas. So here I think unplagued is something that Shakespeare already has, but now sort of Sancho is <laughs> contrasting it or, or combining it with unbeaten, which seems to be new. And then the only new word from uh, royalty. So Elizabeth, Princess Elizabeth writing to her brother, the Prince of Wales. Our dear mother is well, but hurried, my sister very fussy and agitated, the rest of the family in full trim, though hard full from the thoughts of so soon being separated, with laughing faces to keep up one another's spirits. So fussy is the new word here. And compared to Kali, I mean, it, it's a very similar one, so an adjective created with the e suffix. And uh, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting, but yeah, royalty are not really into using recent vocabulary other than this one instance. Then going on to gender, age, education, and so on, we get new words, more new words used by men, but we've also got more data from men. So we kind of still need to develop some more advanced statistics to be able to say whether this is significant. But what we can say with a fair amount of certainty is that there seem to be fewer words by younger people, so from 10 to 29, and also by less well-educated people, so people who got a secondary education or who were apprenticed. And this kind of matches well with previous research on Dutch. 
So their uh, present day Dutch. <laughs> Why that? Well, nobody has really studied this before. So I, I was only able to find this one study and it's on Dutch. But anyway, uh, they find that the highest lexical productivity was among highly educated older men. men. So age, education are definitely factors with, with us. And then also register in terms of the sort of recipient, the relationship between the gender and the sender and recipient of the letter. So we find surprisingly many new words in letters to close friends and then fewer to nuclear family members. So this is consistent with something called the bulge theory, which uh, says that a le less stable relationship between friends kind of triggers more creative language use. So uh, maybe you make more of an effort with friends Whereas with family, you've always got them. So why, why bother doing something creative there? So then going on to semantics a bit. So here we are actually using the historical thesaurus and automatically re retrieving information from that. So uh, we are getting basically three broad categories of words. So I would call them like people. So we put people's emotions, mental capacity, attention, judgment, behavior, manner of action. And this is this kind of makes sense. So we are talking about letters here, which are a very interactive genre. So people people talk about other people. And there are words like ill-natured, cleverality, nichety, missish, fussy. Uh, then we've got words to do with society. So communication, trade, work, way, faith, authority. So words like escritor, which is a kind of writing desk. Then uh, nicknackatory, which is another word for laboratory. A uh, jocular one, and then wagon way, which is to do, to do with coal mining, and then chaplaincy and envoyship. And then world, this is kind of a catch all category, but things like action, space, uh, words like godsend or unsto, or nautical verb there. So I'll give the floor to Edu now to talk about the workflows that enable us to find these new words. Yes. <clears throat> So, in the end, what, what we want to do is this analysis. Look at the semantics of the new words and look at which groups of people use words more often than would be anticipated or more often than other groups. Uh, and that contains complexity in terms of statistical uh, verification in itself. But uh, in this talk, I'll not focus that much on, on, on that part of the pipeline, but instead of the, on the part of how do we uh, automatically or semi-automatically try to find the candidates' new words uh, on which these statistical comparisons are based upon. Uh, and to remind you, we start with this C corpus, so we have five and a 5.2 million words. Uh, we will not go over them one by one. We instead uh, take all of them and then automatically try to compare them against dictionaries, which contain uh, words, as well as these other text collections. And in the case study that you just saw, we had these two criteria that, uh, first of all, we need to see the word in our corpus prior to its uh, Oxford English Dictionary attestation. And there's a hidden uh, requirement in this criteria, which is that we need to be able to match the word to an OED entry in order to compare them. And then the second uh, criteria is that we'll compare them to these large corporal published texts and uh, and filter out any that are uh, seen there many times. And why do we need these two different uh, methods and why do we need to utilize them both? Let's go through that and start with the comparison against dictionaries. So as I said, basically uh, the approach should be really simple. We just take all the words in our corpus and compare them against the dictionaries. However, due to the nature of our corpus, a huge problem immediately comes up, which is that we have a huge amount of spelling variation in the corpus. It's personal letters and more speech-like and varied uh, language 
than is in um, published books even at this time. So uh, depending on, on who is writing and at what point in time, uh, more than half of the words can be in, in spelled in, an, uh, in a way that's not normal in nowadays usage. So for example, right worshipful and my most entirely beloved mother in the most lowly manner, I recommend me unto your good motherhood. Uh, is spelled in a vastly different way than we would spell it now. And uh, this, of course, causes us all kinds of problems when we try to uh, match motherhood and good and unto against dictionaries, which usually contain the modern uh, lemma form of the words. Fortunately, uh, both the Oxford English Dictionary as well as the Middle English Dictionary do contain uh, a lot of variant forms of spellings, historical spellings. So um, it's, it's not all, all hopeless, but even after we use these re resources and utilize these resources, in the end, we are able to directly map only one quarter of the words to the dictionaries and three quarters are simply lost which uh, i'm sure you can imagine is, is quite a bad ratio if we are trying to sort of uh, validly and trustworthily study uh, how different groups coin, coin new words so we cannot really uh, generally trust that we are catching neologisms similarly across all the different groups. So how, to, how do we counter this? Well, first of all, we looked at the proportion of words that we cannot map to dictionaries and find out that spelling seems to standardize, which um, I'm sure will be intuitively obvious to many of you, seems to standardize through time. Uh, so basically, uh, the uh, 18th and 17th centuries, it's uh, much less varied than in the previous ones. So that was one of the reasons that we took the 18th century as our first case study. So with that, uh, in the long 18th century, we first got 32,000 words that were not tagged as proper nouns or foreign words in our letter corpus. And of those, we got 10,000 to match the OED. And then just by comparing the earliest attestation dates, we get down to 470, 487. And yes, Tanya could go through 487 uh, manually, but we have still yet to use our other resource, the com contemporary texts, which will allow us to filter this down even further. So that's the second part in which we compare against other uh, contemporary text collections. And here, as Tanya already said, we have the British Library newspapers, Bernie and Nichols collections, 18th century collections online, and early English books online. And as you can see from the graph on the top right, they very nicely actually do cover, uh, combine, if you combine them, they nicely cover the whole of the uh, Sikh time period. So here uh, we set the criteria that they can occur at a maximum of 100 times in text prior to their first attestation. So why do we set this number to 100? and not some smaller number? The answer is that all of these huge collections, with the exception of early English books online, which has been manually transcribed, have been automatically transcribed using uh, optical character recognition. And that results in uh, character and word errors. 
So if we set the limit that this word cannot appear at all in these comparison corpora, we could filter out incorrectly words just because they have been sort of um, incorrectly OCR'd by a computer. So here, and in the seas, his navy sunk has been transcribed as, and in Theseus, his navy snuck. But still, uh, on a general level, this is actually good OCR, because in these collections, we also get uh, transcriptions like this. So uh, one of the sort of computational analytical problems here is that our material is additionally very uneven and it can contain different amounts of noise in different parts of the collection. So uh, in the end we decided that we are going to sort of fall back and set a, 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 a conservative limit and uh, then cover up with uh, the lack of filtering capacity in that automated li limit by more manual labor. So anyway, in the end, uh, using this, using OED filtering, we get to 487 candidates and uh, by filtering through contemporary text, we finally end up with uh, 220 candidate new words and it was 81 that well, yeah. out of these that were actually new. So 220 you can go through them manually uh, but it's still nice if you have help in doing that. So here comes my sort of interest in developing tools for humanities scholars to do their work more efficiently. So I developed this cool tool called FICA, uh, which comes from filtering and categorization, uh, which is basically on the left-hand side, just a spreadsheet that you can edit. And here, uh, first you have the word as it appears in the C corpus, and on the left left hand side of that, you have our guest uh, lemma form for that. And you get the earliest letter it appears in, and you get uh, how many times it appears in the comparison corpora. So you can use these to sort of get a notion of should this be a neologism or not. But additionally, uh, on the right hand side, you get much more rich contextual information on the word. So on top right hand side, you see the word used in its original context, context in the C corpora. So Mr. Collins price top is not very capital to handle, but rather catchy to look at. In the center, you get uh, how catchy has been used in the contemporary comparison corpora, and mousing over these, you also get the dates. So you can see um, it only shows um, instances where the comparison corpora has this word prior to the seek at the station. And finally, on the lower right-hand side, you get the OED entry that has been sourced for the lemma. And you can see uh, its senses, and using all of these, you can evaluate if was this a neologism or not. And the interaction in this tool has been developed so that it would be as efficient and quick as possible to go through these. So it's mostly keyboard based. So you can just uh, use tab to move between the entries. And there are shortcuts to categorize it as a neologism or not. So that's just sort of a human computer interaction perspective on how to make this manual task of filtering uh, as, uh, as uh, painless, although it, it will never be painless, but as, uh, as painless as possible still. And this is what it all in the end devolves down to, is that we have some tools by which we can come up with candidates we have other tools with which to filter them, 
but because they are not perfect, it'll all devolve in the end to manual verification and filtering in an interface such as this. And so using this, we got the 81 neologisms, which are nice and which can be added to the OED as antedatings, but actually from uh, a sort of trustworthy sociolinguistic analysis perspective, the case study is somewhat flawed because of the criteria we had that the word needs to predate its OED version. And in reality, that means that two thirds of the material, 22,000 of these entries, we couldn't match to the OED. And even if we'd use the sort of 100 uh, contemporary document filter, we could, out of those 22,000, we could filter only 590 out. Uh, so we'd still be left with 21,000 entries to go through. And that's not going to be happening manually. So we uh, see that still a lot needs to be done. And what could we do uh, automatically next? Well, if you remember, our main problem was that there's so much spelling variation, probably there won't be 21,500 new words. Instead, there will be many versions of the same word, just spelled differently. So the answer to that is to try to use automated methods of spelling normalization. So a significant subpart of the project then became experimenting with different ways of doing the normalization. We started with BARD, uh, an established uh, rule-based normalizer that also has a machine learning sort of subset. We tried uh, using the dictionary information that we have using edit distance measures. So we basically just found the nearest dictionary word to, uh, to, to anything that we couldn't automatically or initially match to the dictionaries. And finally, we use these more modern machine learning methods, uh, neural machine translation and statistical machine translation, which all need training material. And for those, we used uh, the variant forms in the dictionaries as well as variant forms already encoded in the C corpus uh, partially. And statistical machine translation also needs a language model. So for that, we need to use the British national corpus. And we experimented with all of these different methods. And the result is that none of them work perfectly. And they're sort of error categories or the types of words that they work well in differ widely. So um, none of them were useful directly. Here in green, you can see the right guesses. And you can see that uh, they sort of are spread um, between all the different methods. So first, we tried to figure out, could we use all of these and somehow uh, combine the different methods via voting schemes or something like that, uh, which is a common um, solution that you'd use in machine learning approaches. But that didn't seem to work. Um, it was just too varied. Next, because in general, the neural machine translation performed best of the individual choices. We tried to boost its support by adding uh, social and century data. So we thought that probably 15th century uh, spelling variation is different from 18th century spelling variation. So if we add this information, the method should work better. Well, it didn't. Uh, but finally, we figured out that if we 
sort of uh, combine multiple neural approaches to dictionary filtering, we can finally come up with a solution that reaches 61% accuracy, uh, which is sort of relatively good um, on the face of it. But we wanted to um, more thoroughly look at how this method of normalization works and how well our pipeline in general works and which kinds of neologism it catches up, catches on, which kind of neologisms it misses, what are the error categories, and so on. So that leads us to our second case study, uh, in which we looked at 17th century letters, and more precisely, uh, the Civil War period of 1640 to 1660. And because we wanted to evaluate our method, uh, also to find out what it was missing, we couldn't use just those that we successfully mapped to the OED, but we had to take a, sort of a whole uh, group of, of words. So if we take every word that in SEEK appears first in 1640 to 1660, that would be 6,300, which again would have been too much. So we took a uh, um, stratified sample by gender, rank, and relationship, ending up with 836 words uh, for, to, for Tanya to manually go through. And regarding uh, the evaluation, uh, even though we thought we had proper nouns and foreign words excluded, apparently all of those hadn't been tagged. So in effect, out of those 836, one, uh, 105 got filtered out uh, by Tanya manually as uh, proper nouns or foreign words. And that left us with 731, of which 60% got the right lemma after this automated normalization. So very much the same as our earlier evaluation of 61%. Uh, 114 got no lemma, so that's still good because if it gets no lemma, uh, you can sort of give that to the end user to evaluate. However, 185 got a wrong lemma. So they were mapped to a lemma or normalized to one, but it wasn't the proper one. So this is problematic if we are now again filtering by sort of uh, the SEEK attestation needing to be before the OED attestation, because uh, if you map to the wrong lemma, you get the wrong OED data. However, even if the normalization were perfect, 20% would still map to a wrong entry because uh, we mapped to the earliest entry. And in cases where, where uh, you, the actual seek uh, instance is of a different part of speech, or there's this zero derivation, we again possibly get a wrong date here. So that's the sort of evaluation of the pipeline. And the conclusion there is, we are definitely not finished here. And there's uh, a lot of types of neologisms that we are not able to catch. And our ways of filtering and processing these are automatically just aren't good enough yet. But before we go to the sort of uh, conclusion of, of, of what that means, let's go through the actual neologisms that we did find in this case. Yes, because they are really interesting to me. So we, we got some <laughs> results, actually. <clears throat> so here we are kind of, well, since it's such a small sample, we were interested in recent rather than totally new vocabulary. So I said, that, OK, let's take uh, the criterion that the first attestation in our corpus can be uh, a maximum of 40 years after the first attestation in the OED. So we're looking at 17th century new-ish vocabulary. 
And what we came up with were 42 new or recent words, and 12 of these were OED antidatings, and three are kind of actual <laughs> neologisms in that they seem to antidate both the OED and the contemporary published texts. And I think they are really cool, especially the last one. So they are packet boat, statement, and T. So we have the first known attestation of the word T in our corpus which is very cool. And this is actually, this prompted one of the people sort of working in the project, Samuel Kaiselnemi, to look up the earlier form of T, which is cha. And we actually found an antidating for that as well in our corpus. So we've got the first known attestation of both T and cha in the letter corpus. So that was super cool. <laughs> and I think we're going to write a small piece about this somewhere. Anyway, uh, so yeah, these uh, sort of uh, more big data approaches can also sort of inspire these smaller scale studies. Just a couple of words. Anywho, uh, examples of the neologisms that we found. They were actually produced, the three sort of anti-datings, uh, by two royalist noblemen who happened to be father and son. So we've got Thomas Howard and William Howard. And uh, Thomas Howard was... Uh, at the time in Dover, he was supposed to accompany the Queen Mother abroad. So basically they were kind of fleeing because of the war. Um, so he writes, Just now come Fabroni and Presidente Conyu are come unto me from Queen Mother to entreat very earnestly that the gentleman coming along with this called Don Martino Dugaldi may instantly pass to Dunkirk for Her Majesty's special service, which depends so much upon it as upon its return or any other sent before by the packet boat. And the packet boat is something that carried the so-called packet of state papers between ports. And apparently it could also carry important people. And again, this doesn't look like it's a super new word to the people using it. So perhaps it was already in some sort of use. And of course, I mean, both packet and boat are quite common words. So it would be really sort of understandable anyway. Then we've got William Howard, who was the son of Thomas Howard. And he was in the Low Countries. So uh, first he is in Antwerp writing to his father. He has received some letters from London and he says, I have received only one letter in which there is a statement that the soldiers went to Mr. John Pendock's house at Kingbury and ransacked it totally. So statement is a really new word at this point apparently. So in the OED the third edition, so the updated edition, the first at the station in 1750. So here we have it from 1642. And again, no indication that it would be somehow weird. So that's interesting. And then the T one. So William Howard was in Amsterdam and writing to his mother, who was also in the Low Countries. I have scarce bought anything for myself but an Indian brew house for tea, which have been very good black black lap work, but it is all spoiled and raised, and yet I paid exceeding dear for it. So tea supposedly came to English from French, but actually the word it was a form tea kind of came to Europe with Dutch merchants. So it kind of makes sense that William Howard would be in Amsterdam using this word. And again, it doesn't look like it's very new, but perhaps his mother also being in the Low Countries would have heard it there. So who are the early adopters using the words that are sort of not older than 40 years, according to the OED? Uh, well, here uh, I think it's very nice that we have like people from the opposite sides of the conflict. So we have Thomas Harrison, who is a parliamentarian army officer. And then we have Sir Hammond Lestrange, who was a royalist polit politician. And also, yeah, he was an MP for Norfolk. And we can again see that there are some social networks between the people here, so uh, where the new words could have possibly spread. So we've got Elizabeth Stuart, the Queen of Bohemia, and then her brother Charles Stuart. We've got uh, friends Henry Oxenden and Charles Nichols, so gentlemen. Then we've got philosophers Anne Conway and Henry Moore, and then William Thomas Howard, whom I already mentioned. But let's take a look at Harrison and the strangest new words. A couple of examples here. So first is Thomas Harrison writing to John Jones, who was another sort of parliamentarian arm, army officer. And I, I think he's talking about the Lord Protector Cromwell here. And this is a bit sort of hard to follow, but anyway. To agree, as is already, to act in dearest love expressed to him named Protector, or Mount Syrian, as the Sidonians called Hermon and David in the spirit, followed that faithfully, believingly, undoubtingly, unanimously, that he would retreat in action of undertaking and so witness repentance by <laughs> condescension, and we would as willingly repent of our sinful dissension. So new words here, believingly and condescension. And I think it's interesting that believingly is here in this long list of words, 
where sort of maybe the others were older and perhaps so easier to understand. And then we've got Lestrange writing to his physician, Thomas Brown. Soon after I received from Mr. Playford himself a large and fervent letter with profession of his skill and respects, which letter, together with his printed manifesto or publication there enclosed, I presume to send unto you to peruse. So here, manifesto is a new word borrowed from Italian, and uh, it seems to have been underlined in the original manuscript, and it's also glossed with or publication. So clearly, Lestrange found it a bit strange. Okay, so we are running out of time, but uh, quickly about social ranks. So uh, what we can say that it looks like upper clergy are quite conservative, which perhaps makes sense. So the, the only new word used by upper clergy is by Brian, Bishop Brian Dapaki, and it's visits as a noun. Then gender and age, same thing as before, actually. So we've got more new words by men, but also more data. But then what we also get, more new words by older people. So we don't have enough data for the different sort of educational categories, so we don't know about that, but it seems like older people use more new words. And also we have surprisingly many new words in letters to close friends and acquaintances, so not as many to nuclear family members again. And there's lots of yeah, interesting stuff we could go through, but here's something on etymology again, sort of things automatically retrieved from the OED. And, uh, yeah, we can see that it's about 50-50 derivatives versus borrowings, and then a couple of compounds and sort of zero derivation instances. And then the language is mostly English, then a lot of Latin, surprisingly little French here actually, but we've got Italian, German and Dutch then. So, here we found that the new 17th century vocabulary was mostly used by the upper and middling ranks, which was interesting because in the 18th century we found lots of new words by the lower ranks. So uh, there are a few things that could explain this. Perhaps they, they had less access to education and specialized registers in the 17th century, the lower ranks, and also, yeah, the upper ranks were where the, were the, where the social networks were. And of course, we don't have very much data in the sample, so that could be uh, an, an influencing factor. But then we found that age and audience design were also factors, like in the 18th century and then that the novelty was sometimes indicated in the text. But let's move on to our conclusions and then we can have the nice Q&A session. So we can now quickly discover dozens of new words in millions of words of running text, but uh, we can't be sure that the automatic methods kind of uncover neologisms equally in each sort of group. So for example, it's very probable that people of lower social ranks uh, write things in more varied ways, so we could be missing things from them, more things from them. So purely automated social linguistic analysis is still impossible and probably will remain so. And uh, yeah, we've kind of find out, found out that we need to ask more focused questions that can be answered by combining the tools we do have with a bearable amount of manual labor. So I don't have to go to, through like tens of thousands of words, I can go through a few hundred words and get some results. And then we can limit it by its time and then filter by appearance and dictionaries and also the texts, contemporary published texts. So rather than asking who uses new words, we can ask who uses new words in the 18th century that come into general use later, or who uses nonce words that are used only once and never seen again. And that's again, there's a lot of candidates, <laughs> but perhaps I could go through all of them. And yeah, we are missing a lot still. So most of zero derivation is missed. We don't look at semantic neologism at this time, and also compounds written separately are usually missed. But anyway, that's what we had for you today. Thank you, and are there any questions now? Thank you very much, Dr. Feli and Dr. Makala. It was very interesting. I really enjoyed, uh, especially looking at all the examples and learning about the tool you developed. And we do actually have some questions that came in already. I'm going to start with a question that I believe is for Dr. McKellar because it's about the tool you developed. So it's a three-part question. The person mm -hmm. is asking, is this tool available online? And can you share its name again? And also, is it possible to use it with a German language? Um, so the idea in developing that tool is that it would become generally available and usable with different sources for context. 
However, it isn't currently uh, sort of configurable by an end user. So you can contact me and we can see if we can get an instance running with a different source of context. So uh, for other tools that I've developed, uh, similar tools, I've in the end uh, packaged them for general use and made them configurable by the end user. Uh, but this one, I haven't done that yet, so I haven't developed it fully yet. And I have also other ideas on how to still develop it. So, um, so unfortunately, not uh, sort of readily available uh, without contacting me, but if you do, then we can uh, look at it together. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got someone with their hands raised, so I'm unmuting um, Angelus Zalumis. So, Angelus, you can answer. Uh, you can ask a question now. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, a similar question about the OCR. Uh, did any of you uh, consider developing any sort of software like the one you have already developed that would take in the, the commonest and most representative printing fonts or calligraphical styles so that they can make it more effective, the, the OCR process? There are multiple projects around mm. the world that are developing better OCR for these historical materials uh, and we are looking into them and we are we have been ex uh, experimenting with neural uh, network based automated transcription and it provides vast, vastly better uh, accuracy than the methods that, that have been used upon which our current data is based on. So in the future, we will surely use these approaches. Um, but as I said, other people are busily uh, developing them. So, so we are just monitoring their progress. And, and once we have the time, we will run the state of the art and thereby improve our data for us to plant it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question I've got here is um, which are the two words from undetermined sources? Ah, now I would have to look them up. I think joke might be one of them actually. So mm -hmm. it isn't quite sure where, where it's from. Um, uh, if you want to complement your question later on, if you need to look something up, we can always um, send that to the person who asked the question by email. Yeah. Yes, let's do that because it would take a bit too much time for all it to. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry that I don't yeah. remember it offhand. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. We can we can pick that up later. So the next question here is that isn't that great wall between spoken usage and written record the major unspoken filter that limits sociological generalizations? Yes, that is the one of the big issues that we are facing if we want to do historical social linguistics. So we don't really have access to speech from that time. And yeah, well, this is kind of the best that we do have. And uh, one thing that we have done is sort of initially we were interested in the people who were the first. So we, we were looking for the inner races, but we are now kind of realizing that we probably don't have access to them. So that would be probably in the realm of speech. So uh, we are now sort of shifting the focus to early adopters of new words instead. And that is something that we can find probably in these written sources. Okay, thank you. Next question is, is also about the tool. So is it possible to apply this tool for phraseological units? What's a phraseological unit? <laughs> More than one word. Right, yes. Yeah, uh, I suppose they mean phrases. Yes, yes, that's possible. Yeah, and actually, I mean, we are, I think we are going to be looking at, for example, compound, compounds written separately. So it's definitely possible to integrate that into this pipeline. Yeah, that's, that's one thing that, uh, that, that we haven't done yet, but in principle, uh, there's nothing precluding us from uh, filtering sort of 
if we can match compounds against dictionaries uh, and predate them, antedate them, we can look at them. Uh, but if we go beyond, uh, beyond these dictionary entries and try to look at uh, multi-word units without them, then we are going to be completely lost because the combinations are so um, explosively many. But uh, precisely through the dictionaries, uh, we can target and attack the subset of these compound units. But uh, if, if you're talking about the FICA tool, uh, then yes, there could be multiple uh, words in a, in a single row to go through. OK, thank you. Um, I'm going to unmute another person so they can ask the question. So now, Andrina and Elstein, you are unmuted. Hello. Thank you very much. I want to know, um, how are you planning to study or to detect first uh, semantic neology as it has not uh, formal differences from what is attested in a dictionary? Yes, we were just talking about this with Etu and uh, I think in our corpus, because it's so small, we probably won't be able to find it automatically. So this is mm -hmm. something that we have to leave out of this project. But in large corpora, there are ways of detecting semantic change, of course. So there are these vector space type methods that yeah. could be used. Again, that is something that multiple people, also some people in the sort of Helsinki computational history group, uh, to which we are somewhat affiliated, are working on. Uh, but all of those methods definitely need much larger corpora. Mm -hmm than this one. So, and I mean, for us as well, uh, most of our troubles come from the fact that we are working on letters and that there's so much spelling variation. We'd be much happier working with published text than in larger and more clean corpora. But the problem there is that if in the end we're interested in the socio-linguistic uh, analysis, those sources do not come with attached uh, sort of high quality and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, multifaceted social metadata. And also, I mean, yeah, letters are like the lowest common denominator. So we've got, if you could write, you could write letters, whereas not everybody wrote published texts, of course. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, next question. I noticed the word unanimous was written in blue italics in one of the example letters, uh, which had other neologisms. Was there yeah. something particular to note about that word there? Yeah, so unanimously here was, uh, it, it was fairly new. It didn't fit our cr criterion. It was more than 40 years old, but I think it was less than 50 years old. So that's why I would put it in blue. I forgot to say that, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but anyway, so there are like a couple of new words in this list and then two very old ones. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Do you think that new lemmatizers could be applied to earlier historical periods for example, Old and Middle English? So, uh, sadly, I omitted the slide uh, from this presentation, but actually our normalizer or lemmatizer uh, worked sort of better for older material than for the 18th century. So, and if you look at machine learned approaches in general, um, they sort of, if you have material from the proper period, uh, training material, uh, it should work better. But actually we also sort of tried that. So we tried teaching a, a 15th century lemmatizer, uh, with purely 15th century uh, training data, and that worked less well than one taught using the whole material. So there's interesting complexity there, uh, but also, um, as I said, our lemmatizer ended up working better 
for the earlier centuries than the later ones. Uh, and we don't know if that's due to the fact that the sort of spelling variation in the earlier centuries is, is somehow more uniform and in the 18th century or uh, spelling variation is just because you don't know how to write an art sort of uh, from a lower class or something. Uh, that was one hypothesis, but also because these are machine learned approaches, our training data actually came more from the early centuries. So it can just be an artifact of that. But yes, I do think that uh, using these neural approaches, you can come up with better lemmatizers also for uh, early English. Okay, thank you. Regarding compound, uh, sorry, regarding compound written separate, separately, have mm -hmm. you have you tried any kind of pro proximity analysis? Words appearing near other words. I'm thinking this might also work in reverse to detect compound word becoming separate and losing their hyphens. Um, there is a follow up to the question, but unfortunately, it was over the the character limit, so. Um, that's all I have here. Yeah. So uh, when we have been manually filtering these, uh, one error category that does show up is words that are parts of compounds and can be spelled separately or with a hyphen or together. Uh, and I do think that with these dictionary resources and possibly also by sort of um, using the corpora and discovering this there. We do in, not in this uh, project, but elsewhere, we are using collocation analysis and statistical uh, analysis of that for different purposes. So I have, that has been something that, that, that I, has been uh, on the back of my mind multiple times that we ne do need to take into the pipeline and start tackling so that we get this one source of, of errors uh, uh, tackled. Mm. And of course the study of spelling variation over time is really interesting in itself and this is something that is being done by other people in our project so our corpus can be at least in part used for that as well. Okay, thank you. Um, yet another question. Have you considered approaching the research question via OED citations, somehow automating analysis of the backgrounds of the people cited or, or antedating? You would then be able to consider data for new senses as well as new words. Yeah, so we could look at, yeah. Well, the trouble with the OED citations is that we, we know the people who they were by, but then we don't have sort of any other information on them. Well, of course, it can be retrieved from other sources, but then it, I don't think we've kind of developed ways of automatically, well, you can, of course, you can guess people's gender by their first name, so that is something that can be done. So it, it might be possible to some extent, but of course, I mean, yeah, part of the thing that we're doing here is kind of complementing the information in the OED. So it's kind of, it's not really a linguistic corpus, although people have used, used the OED as a corpus as well. But sort of, the, yes, so it perhaps doesn't quite represent all of the social categories that we would like it to re represent. But definitely that would be one way of getting at, at least a little bit into the, the census. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, um, we have been thinking of going, getting past the seek, which is massive variation. Uh, that would mean that that we wouldn't get as varied social backgrounds, but we would still get uh, men and women and different age group at, at least. So, in in a different project, we have been sort of uh, trying to because we have the 18th century collections online, so we have been trying to um, 
join to that metadata on people's birth dates and their actual identity and gender and occupations and stuff like that from the virtual international authority files and uh, uh, Oxford, what's the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. The next question here is how much do you think traveling in the 17th and 18th centuries has played a role in the way English was spelled, pronounced and written? I consider traveling also from a socio-cultural point of view an exchange among people. Ooh, that's a really good question. A nice one. And I think it might well have played a quite a large role, actually. And I mean, even, even the first attestation of the char form of tea, it was actually produced by a merchant of the East Eng what? English East India Company in Japan. So we've got these people who are traveling abroad and they, they definitely are contributing to the English language. So yes, uh, difficult to sort of quantify, but I definitely think that there is something there. And of course, I mean, the vocabulary of English is so much sort of borrowed from other places that, yeah, especially there, I suppose, the influence would be very big. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, are there metadata about the language spoken by the writers and whether English was the first or only language? If yes, was this reflected in their creativity? Ooh, good question again. There is no uh, machine-readable metadata on that, but we have some sort of uh, pretext fields where we have noted things like whether the person spoke multiple languages. And definitely in the case of, for example, the clergyman Thomas Twining, so he was a classical scholar, so he would have known Greek and Latin. So that definitely probably influenced the way that he created new words. And we've got lots of sort of borrowings from him, but also sort of derivations from English word stock. Okay, but, thank uh, you. Yeah, a good question. Um, the other question here is, um, do you have any idea why less stable relationships contribute more to the creation of new words the difference between correspondence between close friends in contrast to that between nuclear family members? Yeah, well, it's, at least in the 18th century, it seems like the function of letter writing was often to sort of keep in touch with friends and build this relationship between friends. So in that sense, I mean, it would make sense that then people would make more of an effort when writing to friends to sort of come up with something new and it's also about sort of building this in group that they belong to and yeah whereas for perhaps the nuclear family you wouldn't need to do that and of course maybe in the nuclear family you would live close to them anyway so perhaps the, this would happen more in speech so that's of course one one contributing factor okay um another question since foreign words were excluded how were you distinguishing between foreign words versus borrowing that were considered new English words? Yes, good question again. <laughs> so uh, the foreign words, it, it's, it's definitely, we, we could be missing something that has been tagged as foreign, but was actually perhaps sort of already a new word in English. But uh, this affects only part of the corpus. So part of the corpus has been tagged for part of speech. And this has been actually checked manually by one person, Arya Normi. And uh, it's, yeah, so basically it's her decision in a way what is foreign <laughs> in that part that has been tagged. So we have trusted her there, but definitely if, if we want to be really completist, we, we should go in there. I mean, most of them are, are really like they are passages of French or Latin or whatever. And then, yeah, it's pretty obvious that they are not new words, but there's definitely there, something there that could be missing. So, yeah, good question. Okay, and next question. How did you manage to collect the metadata about the writers and how accurate is this information? And the person has just complimented the question by saying, uh, just to complement my question, I work with, with 12th century lyrics and intend to develop a lemmatizer, having in mind that most of those texts were not signed 
or consist of copies? Um, how could we consider? Uh, how could we collect information about the social linguistics background of the writers? Mm. Yeah, well, for us it was in a way fairly easy because the uh, corpus is based on published uh, original spelling editions of letters. So the editions usually have some information on the people's social backgrounds. And uh, well, this has been a long project. So we've had like a number of research assistants working on this over the years, and they have been uh, mining various different sources for this. So in, in addition to the editions, uh, there are like historical resources online, of course, and there is the ODNB, so the Dictionary of National Biography and so on. And yeah, perhaps it's somewhat easier for us also because we are working with mostly early and late modern English, so it's easier to get at the people. But for some people we don't really have that much information, so for some we only know, okay, this is some random person who wrote to the person where from which we got the edition and then we know, okay, maybe we know their gender. But in principle, if we were not able to get any information on the writer, we did not include that letter in the corpus, so we, we have to know at least something. So in that sense, it's pretty good. And of course, I mean, it, it then depends on the accuracy of the edition and so on. So some of the editions that we have are from the 19th century, for example, and then how well did they actually sort of find out about the social backgrounds of people. So it's, and of course, it's always a matter of interpretation, for example, the, the social rank or social class of people. So this was really, really hard. I was, I was a research assistant in the project from, from 2005 and so on. Uh, it, it took a lot of tr time trying to place the people sometimes. Yeah, so a lot of manual labor and then filtering out uh, people who you cannot get reliable information on. Mm. Um, but that an important uh, aspect here methodologically is that if we are studying the content of language, then uh, we really cannot use computational or machine learned tools to derive the metadata from the language or else we'd end up in a circle and a circuit. Uh, and would not be able to trust our results. So, so that's why we've also been, when we've sort of thought of expanding to other materials where we do not have such quality sort of hand curated external resource metadata, uh, we've been hitting walls. Can we sort of, we cannot use uh, sort of this natural language processing techniques to try to derive uh, the information about the persons or their language or, or, or things like that for the sort of reflective metadata. Okay, thank you. And the last question I can see here, and I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up with this one because we are running out of time, but it's another question about the tool. So can this tool be used with modern corpora, that is social media? Uh, depends on which tool and which part of the pipeline yeah, you should are. Yeah, we actually show this picture of the pipeline? Yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this uh, this shows sort of all the different tools and parts that go into this. So multiple different comparison corpora and data sources, as well as multiple tools and processing uh, units that go there. So. Um, some of these will be usable for the study of modern social media data. Uh, some of them won't, and it's really hard to give a general answer. It will all uh, devolve into the particulars of, of what you're interested in and what your material is. But I can say more generally in that my whole sort of research track and interest has been in finding common tasks and commonalities between different projects that use very different materials and, and ask very different questions. And I have been able to find sort of similar needs in them, such as these filtering and categorization and, um, and uh, statistical collocation analysis and projecting from text to metadata and so on. So uh, definitely 
based on that experience, I'm sure that some of the parts will be usable, but they would need sort of tuning and configuration and some parts of the pipeline just won't fit and would need to be replaced. Thank you very much. So thank you again, Dr. Saley and Dr. McKellar for a very interesting talk and I hope everybody enjoyed it. So thanks again. And I think from us for now, it's a goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.